Good evening. My name is David Clark, and I'm the minister here at Boone's Creek Christian Church, and I want to welcome everyone to the gathering of the churches. I think this is the 189th time in a, consecutively this has happened. So they were doing it back during the Civil War. How does that make you feel? None of you were here, right? But anyway, thank you to everyone for being a part tonight and all the churches and the promotion that's gone on. It's good to see a lot of people here and just reacquaint or re reconnect. We don't see each other that often. Um, I want to ask everyone, if you would, let's just bow our heads. We'll have a word of prayer together. God, we thank you for this opportunity to worship together. And Father, for the joy of friendships and brotherhood in Christ that we share. Father, thank you for the day of worship we've had in our churches, for the word that has been proclaimed, the gathering around the table that has taken place, Father, the praises that have been offered. Tonight, Father, we come before you humbly to bow, to ask your spirit to be among us, to guide us in worship, that, Father, we approach you with humble hearts, but hearts that are made bold by the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. Father, guide us in worship, we pray. We do all of this in Jesus' name. All of God's people say it. Amen.
I've been asked to share the Restoration History Moment with you tonight, and uh, I want to begin by telling you that in the year 1827, just two years before this gathering met for the very first time, another significant event in the history of our movement took place. It happened in the town of New Lisbon, Ohio on November 18th of that year. A gentleman named William Amond went to the Baptist Meeting House in New Lisbon in order to hear a visiting preacher. He went with very low expectations, and so he lingered outside the building on the edge of the overflow crowd that had gathered there. For some time before this, William Amond had been studying the scriptures, and he was waiting to hear someone preach the gospel like Peter did on Pentecost. And if and when that happened, William Amond had resolved to obey it. Although he himself was a Presbyterian, he had come to the conclusion that he needed to be baptized according to the teaching of Peter in Acts 2.38. In a letter he wrote later to this visiting preacher, he said, To this scripture I often resorted. I saw how Peter had opened the kingdom and the door into it. But, to my great disappointment, I saw no man to introduce me, though I prayed much and often for it. William Amon's long wait was about to come to an end. That visiting preacher was Walter Scott, who had recently been hired by the Mahoning Baptist Association as a traveling evangelist. His mission was to revitalize the stagnating churches of the association and to bring new converts into the kingdom. Scott had begun to embrace the plea for New Testament Christianity that was being promoted by Alexander Campbell, and the reformers who were embedded within that association. His text that day was his favorite, Matthew chapter 16, verse 16, in which Peter confesses Jesus as the Christ, the Son of the living God. Walter Scott considered that statement to be the great central truth of the Christian faith. And in his later years, he would write a lengthy book devoted to that topic entitled The Messiahship or The Great Demonstration. For Walter Scott, everything centered around Christ. His approach to the gospel contrasted sharply with the call to conversion that was typical at that time on the American frontier. He rejected as unscriptural the widely held idea that one had to agonize over one's sins and wait for the gift of saving faith and have a special experience of the Holy Spirit in order to be certain that one was saved. Instead, he insisted that faith is a matter of accepting the testimony about Christ and acting in accordance with that acceptance. Later on, he would develop this into a system that he used quite effectively in his evangelistic efforts, and many of us are familiar with it. We know it as the five-finger exercise, hence the hand on the screen. This was a memory device that Scott used whenever he came to a new community to preach. He gathered the children together and went through this exercise with them, and then he instructed them to share this information with their parents, along with the news about when and where he would be preaching that evening. The exercise has become well known throughout our movement, and in its original form, it went as follows. First, came faith. Next, repentance. Then baptism. Remission of, the, of sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. The first three fingers represent our response to the gospel, and the last two describe what God does for us in response. This approach to evangelism proved to be quite effective in the years following Scott's visit to New Lisbon. By some estimates, he baptized 30,000 converts over a period of 30-some years. Those numbers gave our movement the critical mass that it needed to have a wider impact. And it all began in New Lisbon, Ohio. William Amon was Walter Scott's first convert. He pushed his way to the front of the crowd when he heard Scott say these words. The scriptures shall no longer be a sealed book. God means what he says. Is there anyone present who will take God at his word and be baptized? or the remission of sins. That same day, William Amond was baptized in a nearby creek and became the first of thousands who came to know Christ through the preaching of Walter Scott. 
So let's hand it to Walter Scott. He not only gave us the five finger exercise, but more importantly, he left us the legacy reminding us that we should always keep Christ at the center and we should always be devoted to sharing the good news. We've had another great year at Appalachian Christian Camp. Over a thousand students and over 300 volunteers came to camp this summer. We're full into retreat season now and that's going great too. Since summer camp ended, we've hosted 27 different groups here. It is such a blessing to see thousands of people come through here every year and see their lives changed. And we're so grateful for your support. Please continue to send kids to camp, give financially, host your retreats here, and pray for our ministry. Thank you. Hello friends, I'm Mike Luzatter from the Campus House, Christian Student Fellowship at ETSU. We're a ministry aimed directly at the students here at the university because we think it's an important generation. A generation that's asking important questions, a generation that wants real answers. We meet each week to do things that you would expect us to do, like worship, like Bible study, like meals, like just getting together and knowing each other. One of the more important new aspects of our ministry has been an attention given to international students. We invite students to our campus house each Friday for what we call World Cafe, where we can build relationships with them, get to know them a little bit more, as we can share the word of Christ with them. Thank you for praying for us. Thank you for making this ministry an important ministry in your church. Thank you for your support uh, and your endeavors on our behalf. We appreciate you. Hope. For 71 years, that's what the East Tennessee Christian Home has stood for, hope. Hope to children who have been abandoned, hope to children who have been neglected, hope to children who have been abused or had behavior problems. Not only have we provided hope, we've also provided purpose. In the last several years, we've had over 20 young ladies who have accepted Christ and have been baptized, providing hope eternal to those young ladies. And you have assisted in providing that hope. Through your generosity, through your giving, and through your prayers, we will continue to provide hope until the Lord tarries. Please visit us at www.etcha.org and find out more about our ministry and how we can continue to provide hope for years to come. Thank you, and may God bless you as you continue to serve Him in your congregations. Well, good evening, everyone. Um, one of the most natural things for us to do when we've gathered together is to celebrate what Jesus is doing in our lives and the lives of those around us. So would you stand with us as we worship together this evening? Say heaven thunder. Heaven thundered and the world was born. Life begins and ends in the dust you form. Faith commanded and the mountains moved. Fear is losing ground to our hope. Let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Freedom conquered, all our chains undone. Sin defeated, Jesus is overcome. Mercy triumph when the third day dawned. Darkness was denied when the stone was gone. Let's sing it out together, church. Unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Oh. Sing the 
this out with confidence. Nothing shall be impossible. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Nothing shall be impossible. Your kingdom reigns unstoppable. We'll shout your praise forevermore. Jesus, our God, unstoppable. Let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. Oh, unstoppable God, let your glory go on and on. Impossible things in your name, they shall be done. this out, be thou my vision. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. Not be all else to me, say that thou art. Thou my best thought, by day or by night. Waking
heart of my own heart. Standing here in your presence In a grace so relentless I am one By perfect love Wrapped within the arms of heaven In a peace that lasts forever Sinking deep In mercy see I'm wise
and all my heart is yours. Oh, fear removed, bring you in, I lean into your love. so thankful that we can gather together like this and sing to you and, and see what you're doing here with our friends, with family, and also in the world. We love you and we praise you. And this is all in your name we pray. Amen. Amen. You can take a seat. Hi, East Tennessee Christian Convention. I want to thank you from Higher Ministries for all of your love, your prayers, and your support over the last 12 years. In this time, because of your support, we've been able to provide over a thousand ministers, over 5,000 free coaching and counseling sessions, and helping many churches from all over the region discover purpose and mission for their congregation. And that wouldn't have been possible without your support. So thank you for the last 12 years, and we look forward to partnering with you for many, many more to come. On behalf of everyone at Milligan College and Emmanuel Christian Seminary at Milligan, I just wanted to take a moment to thank you, everyone at the East Tennessee Christian Convention for your prayers, for your advocacy, for your financial support. You make a difference in our students' lives and you make it possible for us to train men and women to be servant leaders, to go out and have an impact around the world on the mission field, in pulpits, in classrooms, in courtrooms, in boardrooms, in any number of, of venues. And we're just grateful for the kind of support, the generosity, and certainly the prayers that you offer up on our behalf. If I've done my calculations correctly, I first met tonight's speaker in September of 1983. He was the new kid in school, having just moved to the area from some godforsaken place or another. And he made quite an impression. A head full of bushy hair, a lot of energy, and the kind of general goofiness that we all came to appreciate over time. And it didn't take us very long to figure out that especially when it came to math, this dude was very, very smart. And if you know Ethan today, you'll know that he somehow still has a full head of hair, though it's not quite as shaggy as I've seen it before. He still has a lot of energy, and if you catch him at the right time, he can still be pretty goofy. And he's still very smart. Which is why it came as some surprise to me this week when we were supposed to meet up for breakfast and Ethan showed up at the restaurant a full day early. So he may have a little trouble telling Monday from Tuesday, but still, he's very smart. And after graduating from high school, Ethan went to Swarthmore College in Pennsylvania. Now, if you aren't familiar with Swarthmore, it may be because you, like me, had about as much chance of getting into Swarthmore as our Tennessee football team has of beating Alabama in a given year. <laughs> After graduating from such a prestigious college, Ethan's options in professional or academic fields were probably just about limitless. But he chose to return to Northeast Tennessee to attend Emmanuel and begin his ministry career on the staff of Grandview Christian Church. A successful minister, ministry on the staff of Mountain Christian Church was to follow, and in 2016, Ethan, his wife Betsy, and their two sons, Evan and Bryant, returned to God's country for Ethan to serve as a senior minister at First Christian Church in Johnson City. So Ethan has an impressive academic and ministry background and hair, and is doing great work at First Christian. But I think we would all agree that resume and education alone don't necessarily guarantee successful ministry. Truly effective ministers for the kingdom also must have a pastoral servant's heart. I'd like to finish my introduction with a, a quick personal story that I feel speaks to what kind of person, what kind of minister I know Ethan to be. 
In 2003, my father passed away. He was living in Knoxville at the time, and I'd been living out of state for several years. Ethan was still living in Johnson City and serving at Grandview. We'd remained friends over the years, but we didn't really see each other a lot or have much contact in that particular time. But the day after my father died, Ethan and another friend of ours, Mike White, who's here tonight too, came to Knoxville and spent the day with me, encouraging me, praying with me, and just being for me, there for me in a difficult time. To this day, I, I don't even know how they found out that my dad had died. I'll never forget that, and I'm confident that there are many people in the churches that Ethan has served that have similar stories to tell. It's my pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Ethan Mike. Well, Brent, thank you for that introduction. Uh, I'll say I have been thrilled with every aspect of being a part of this convention, and I only faced fear at one moment, and that was when I discovered that Brent would be doing my introduction. Uh, and uh, so thank you. That was very gracious. Considering the stories you could have told, those you chose to tell, that was very, very gracious. Yeah, <laughs> indeed. Oh, I've been warned to remind the choir that you are on camera. So they told me that. I put it in my notes. It says, remind the choir. So I'm sorry about that. If that's more than you can take and you slip out while I'm preaching, I get it. You won't hurt my feelings. Uh, and listen, friends, it is super to be here with you tonight. I'm so grateful for the invitation. I want to I wanna thank the faithful people who have kept this uh, community alive for all these 189 years. That's amazing. And I'll be honest, I don't even know everybody that needs to be thanked. I do know the person who keeps emailing me and gets me to all the meetings is Greg Key. So at the very least, I want to thank him. There are probably lots of other people I should be thanking that I'm not, and my apologies, but... Uh, I know Greg Key has really done a lot to get me here, and so I appreciate that, Greg, and thank you for your work for that. Uh, before I get going, and you know, this is it's always hard to know how to work things like this in, but um, it seemed to me appropriate to just say a minute to pray for Texas. I suppose if you've watched the news this afternoon, you know another, it almost, it feels like it's, it's not even strange enough anymore, another terrible shooting. And so if you'll join me, I just want to pray uh, for that small town in Texas, if you'd join me. God, I don't even exactly know what the prayer is. Heal, protect, comfort. God, I, if there's a way to us to make some strategic choices that make this less common, help us to have the wisdom to see it. Do your grace work in this church and in this community. Even as we grieve and wonder and ask why, God, and look to you for your rescue, God, we do know that you are the one who is able to work good in the midst of great tragedy, and so we would just boldly ask you to do that, that which only you can do. We offer our lives and the lives of the whole world into your care that you might redeem what is lost. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. Um, well, let me get rolling here with just a sort of mini commercial. You know the rule that when you're a guest in someone's home, you should bring a gift, right? Did we ever teach you that? And so I do want to let you know up front, a lot of the message that I want to bring was inspired by a book. This book served as the inspiration for a sermon series that we did at First Christian this year. Uh, and if, you, if after the message you're interested, I did bring a ton of copies. They're out at what's called the Information Hub, straight out the central doors. I brought a ton of copies uh, of both the book by Michael Frost and the group curriculum that we used at First Christian. I got enough. Every church here could take home three or four. If you're interested in it, take it home, look at it. We did it our whole 
whole church did it. Like uh, we had more than a thousand people participating. It was awesome. So if you would like to do that in the same way at your church, if you're like, hey, this would be good for our church too, we'd be happy. We could give you all our graphics and give you the curriculum and whatever. We'd be happy to make that available to you. So that's a little commercial. Um, I got tons of copies back there. I sure don't want to have to load them back into my car. So I'd love for you to grab a few. Read them with your elders, maybe, or read them with uh, your pastor or something. If you think it'd be useful for your church and we can help you do that with your church, we'd, we'd love to help you do that. Um, my message tonight is a, a message about evangelism. I love that he told a little bit about the life of Walter Scott. I love the life of Walter Scott. I learned uh, the five-finger exercise as a little boy and grew up on the stories of his magnificent evangelistic energy and the power of the Holy Spirit that was alive in him everywhere he went. I, I, I sometimes would dream that I, too, could one day be like Walter Scott But over time, the stories of people like Walter Scott began to have a curious um, implication in my life. They began to have a curious effect on my psyche. Over time, I noticed that when I heard sermons on evangelism, when I heard stories of people like Walter Scott, I experienced less and less inspiration and more and more guilt. Has that ever happened to you? When you hear somebody talk about the urgency with which we must evangelize our generation, when you hear somebody challenge you to become in your way an evangelist, when you hear the story of Walter Scott, and and then at the end we tell the story and then we say, okay, you go do that, baptize your 30,000 people, preach to the rooms that are spilling over because they're so full. Over time, I realized I was less and less inspired and more and more overwhelmed. I began to discover that talking to a stranger about anything was terrifying to me. Talking to them about the gospel, doubly so. I began to discover that despite everything I knew, the actual thought that I would go to some friend of mine and pressure them to come to church with me was just something I wasn't going to do. I mean, I would preach about doing it, to be sure. I just wouldn't actually do it. You know what I'm saying, right? I, in fact, was not spending my time mustering winsome arguments to persuade people to follow Jesus Christ. I was more likely hoping they wouldn't ask me what I do on Sunday mornings, right? Because I didn't want to bring it up. I discovered that talking about evangelism, and I discovered over time I wasn't the only one, that for so many of us, talking about evangelism leaves us feeling either guilty or powerless or both. Guilty because we are not at the front lines of sharing our faith, powerless because we are convinced we could never be at the front lines of sharing our faith. And yet... I think we're supposed to be. And so here I am preaching about evangelism after he tells the story of Walter Scott. And already I know some of you are thinking, great, I'm going to leave tonight feeling guilty because I'm not going to do anything with it. Or I'm going to leave tonight feeling powerless because I already tried this before. I know I can't do anything with it. And you could be right. But I hope not. Because here's the thing. My guilt aside, my sense of powerlessness aside, my sense of dread aside, every time somebody brings up evangelism, regardless of all these things I feel, the the fact remains we are called to be evangelists. And my emotional dis-ease with that reality doesn't change the reality. I love the way the Apostle Paul puts it when he writes to the Corinthian church. He, He makes it clear there is no delay. He says, therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. There is no delay between having become reconciled to God and now being responsible for the ministry of reconciliation. 
There's not even a breathing period, right? Like, okay, I've only been a Christian for 40 years. I'm not sure I'm ready to be an evangelist yet, right? There's none of that. If anyone is in Christ, the new creation is here. And if you've been reconciled to Christ, the ministry of reconciliation now belongs to you. But somehow, the certainty that I am called to be an evangelist never translated into confidence that I actually could pull it off. And my guess is the same is true for you, that the clarity you may have that if you are in Christ, you are called to be an evangelist for Christ, doesn't do much to change the deep discomfort you might have with the prospect of actually living out this calling. You see, most of us have entered into an unspoken agreement with each other. We will all agree that theoretically we should be evangelists, But none of us will actually ask anybody, when's the last time you shared your faith? I won't ask you, and you won't ask me, so none of us will have to be so embarrassed by the fact that we live in continual rejection of the obvious call of Scripture. So I won't ask you, and you won't ask me, right? This is our agreement. Like, I mean it. Like, on the way out, you better not ask me, because that's going to be crazy awkward, and I promise I won't ask you either, okay? I think, though, There is a way out of this trap. There is a way out of this endless cycle of clarity met with guilt because we feel powerless. And I think the way out is to dig a little deeper into what exactly Scripture is asking of us when it calls us to be reconcilers on behalf of God. What is scripture calling us to and asking of us when it calls us to live evangelistic lives? Because I'll just, I'm going to go on a limb here. I don't think all of us are called to be Walter Scott. Now, now listen, I'll be clear. In my dreams, I'd love to be Walter Scott. Let's, let's be clear. You know, that, that's what I dream about. Yeah, sure. But, but so far, God hasn't done that with my life. And I don't think all All of us are called to be Walter Scott. Look at the way Paul talks about evangelism. Ephesians 4, 11 and 12, just one little snippet here. He says, so Christ himself gave some, emphasis on the some, to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers, to equip his people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up. To some, the special gift of being an evangelist has been given. So that the whole body of Christ may be built up. Look the way he talks when he writes to the Colossian church. He's wrapping up a discussion of his ministry and his life and their ministry. He's been talking. Oh, go back and read Colossians 3. Colossians 3 is amazing. He's been talking about this new life we've been called to. He says, put, take off the old life, put on the new. And he calls them to radically different lives. And right after he calls them to a radically different life, he then says this, Colossians 4, 2 through 6, devote yourselves to prayer, being watchful and thankful, and pray for us too, that God may open a door for our message so that we may proclaim the mystery of Christ for which I am in chains. Pray that I may proclaim it clearly as I should. Be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so you may know how to answer anyone. It's an interesting little thing here. We need to notice what Paul is doing. And you've got to pay attention to what Paul is doing, because some of you, you may be gifted just like Paul was. You may be gifted just like Walter Scott was. And so, like Paul, you may need to be doing what Paul was doing. Preaching the gospel publicly, proclaiming in front of the masses the mystery of Christ to the point where he got locked up for it. Some of us need to be doing that. Some of you need to be doing that. Some of you need to open your mouths and use the gift which God has given you. But look what Paul asks the church in Colossians, in Colossae, to do. To the whole church, he says, pray for me that there will be an open door for the words I would say. And then you 
be watchful for the opportunity to speak and make the most of every opportunity when it comes. Let your conversation be full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. The implications of that last little phrase are going to become important to us as we go forward. So that you may know how to answer everyone, which implies that somebody is asking you. Paul is describing two different kinds of evangelistic lives. The one, like Walter Scott's and Paul's, is centered on the big and bold public proclamation speaking to the masses. The other is centered on a Colossians 3 sort of life, a life that begins to startle people so that they start to ask you questions. You see, the life of the evangelist is the life of public proclamation, and some of you are called to it, but the life of the evangelist is not the same as the evangelistic life. The evangelistic life is a life of blessing and vigilance. Blessing for the whole world, vigilance for the moment when somebody acts, asks, always acting wisely and trusting that your wise Christ-like actions will leave you to the opportunity to tell of your hope. And this is not just an isolated thing that Paul gives advice right here. This is exactly the advice Peter gives in 1 Peter chapter 3. I want to read a long little chunk to you here to see how Peter thinks that the Christ-like life is the evangelistic life life. But first Peter chapter three, verse eight. Finally, everybody be like-minded, be sympathetic, love one another, be compassionate and humble. Do not repay evil with evil or insult with insult. On the contrary, repay evil with blessing because to this you were called so that you may receive a blessing. For whoever would love life and see good days must keep their tongue from evil, their lips from deceitful speech. They must turn from evil and do good. They must seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous. His ears are attentive to their prayer, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. Tell me again, he says, who is going to harm you if you are eager to do good? But even if someone should, even if you should suffer, For doing what is right, you are blessed, so do not fear their threats and do not be frightened. Peter spends a handful of verses here describing this remarkable life. A life where you repay evil with blessing. A life where you're always choosing to do good. A life where you suffer, but yet you do not turn to evil. He describes this remarkable life. And then listen to the turn he makes in verse 15. So in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. Always be ready to give an answer to everyone who asks you to give the reason for the hope that you have. But do this with gentleness and respect, keeping a clear conscience so that those who speak maliciously against your good behavior in Christ may be ashamed of their slander. I grew up hearing a lot about this always be ready. I'm sorry, my wire is twisted here. Right. Fix that. Okay, great. We're back at it. Thank you. Pardon me. I grew up hearing a lot about this invitation to always be ready to give an answer. And every time I heard that, that to me was an invitation to get focused on my big speech. Right? I got to get ready to give my big speech because the only vision of an evangelist that I knew was Paul and Walter Scott. So I had to get ready to give my big speech. It wasn't until much later in life that I I encountered the big problem with that response to this text. I was getting readier and readier to give my big speech and nobody was asking. It tells me to be ready to give my answer, but nobody was asking me. Nobody was coming up and saying, Ethan, I can just tell you face evil so bravely. What's different about you? Ethan, I can just tell you never repay evil with evil. You always repay evil with blessing. Tell me what's different about you. Nobody was asking. I was spending so much time on my answer. And I was spending no time learning to live a life that would make someone ask the question. And that's what 1 Peter is talking about. 
First Peter actually thinks that the answer is remarkably simple. He doesn't want you to prepare a complicated answer. Give the reason for the hope that's in you. That's almost a one-word answer, right, Jesus? I mean, maybe you could make it 10 words. You know, Jesus died on the cross for my sins. I don't even know how many words that is. But, I mean, it's a short. The answer is not the point here. The answer is the life that he describes in the chapter preceding it that would lead people to ask the question, church, what it means for us to live evangelistic lives is not for every one of us to be a Paul or a Walter Scott. The tr- we need people. Some of us are those people, and we still need those people, and those people still exist. But the call for all of us is to live lives that make people wonder. This book uh, that kind of inspired this series, uh, this one is here, Surprise the World, Michael Frost, it's free out there, go grab one. Okay, he writes this, and this is so helpful to me, the clarity he puts to this in. He says this, the biblical model of evangelism is for leaders to identify, equip, and mobilize gifted public evangelists. Walter Scott, the Apostle Paul. And for everyone to be inspired by God to live a questionable life. To live a life that makes people wonder. If all believers are living the kinds of lives that are described in 1 Peter... If all believers are living the kinds of lives that evoke questions from their friends, then opportunities for sharing our faith abound. And they become so natural and easy. And the chances for the gifted evangelists to to declare the gospel in these public settings are magnified. Our task, he says, this is where the title of the book comes from, our task is to surprise the world. I don't need to feel guilty that I don't want to shout the Bible at strangers. And you don't have to feel guilty about that either. And I don't need to feel powerless because I have trouble just bringing up Jesus spontaneously in the middle of a conversation at Panera Bread. What I have to do is be prepared to give an answer for the hope that I have in me and then go Live a life that surprises the world so that they will ask questions. One of the things you learn in seminary is that you haven't really done a sermon series unless you make a t-shirt to go with it. That's what they teach you. So, so we did. We made t-shirts to go with it. It's real simple. The whole, the, whole, the whole point is real simple. Live a life that surprises people and then be ready to answer their questions. That's the whole series. Also note to you preachers, if you have a themed t-shirt, you get to preach in a t-shirt for the whole series. So there you go. No, no. So live a life. Oh, I'll show you back here. Ready? Live a life that surprises the world, exclamation point, and then be ready when people ask questions. It turns out, are you ready for this? That to be an evangelist, you don't need a bullhorn. You just need to be weird. And then all of a sudden I discover not only am I spiritually gifted for evangelism, I'm the most gifted evangelist I know. If weird is the only qualification, right? That's it. You just, if you just be weird enough in a godly direction, eventually somebody will ask, what is your deal? And you'll get to tell them, my deal is Jesus and he's made me weird. They'll wonder, were you, were you weird before Jesus? And you'll admit, yes, I was a little weird before Jesus, but now I'm weird in a Jesus direction. Now, some of you, I think, might be starting to get a glimmer that that could be possible. Some of you might be thinking, okay, if all I had to do was be weird, now that I could pull up. Now, now but don't, let's not tease ourselves. It's not going to be easy For us to live lives that genuinely surprise the world will not be easy because most of us have been well-trained to live very unsurprising lives. Most of us have been well-trained to live lives that lead no one to ask any questions. For most of us, our lives and our habits 
are perfectly explained by where we grew up, how old we are, and how much money we make. For most of us, our entire life is perfectly explained by those three little details, one cultural, one age, one economic. You know those three details, you can, most of us. For most of us, our lives are easily explained by American middle-class values. We mow our lawns, not too often, but often enough to satisfy the neighbors. We spend a little bit less than we make, or sometimes a little more than we make, depending on how much credit we like to use. We take a couple of vacations a year. We aren't mean to people, but we don't go out of our way to be nice to people. The reason I know that most of you live lives that wouldn't surprise your neighbors if they knew where you grew up, how much money you make... And how old you are is that my life is pretty unsurprising, too, most of the time. My neighbors aren't looking at me and wondering what's up with that guy. I mean, well, sometimes they are, but not in a godly way. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and, and it's worse than this, of course. For many of us, even our religious lives is hardly surprising. You know, if you get up early and go to Starbucks and read a devotional book at Starbucks, you're not really surprising anybody. I'm not saying it's not a good thing. It's probably a great thing. It's probably something God's using in your life. I'm just saying it's not going to surprise somebody. The barista at Starbucks isn't going to come over to you and say, what are you doing? What's different about you? Attending church on a Sunday morning doesn't surprise people. Nobody's being startled by this. For most of us, if we wanted to be weird enough in a godly enough direction so that someone would ask, actually ask us a question, it would not be enough for us to just maintain our current middle-class East Tennessee religious habits. We'd have to intentionally build some weirdness into our life. And that's the invitation I have for you tonight. If you're interested, grab the book. It's the invitation of the book. The invitation of the book is to develop some intentionally weird habits that would be just weird enough that someone might ask, and then you could answer. If you don't like you know, books like this, you want to go read the Bible, go read, read Colossians 3 and 1 Peter 4. You develop those habits, I promise you'll be weird enough. Somebody will notice. Because there are people out there, you need to know it is still possible, just because your devotion at Starbucks and going to church on Sunday morning isn't enough to surprise somebody. It is still enough to surprise somebody. I've got a friend, they've been fostering kids. They're always, they've got a foster kid in their home all the time. She gets to share her faith all the time. Because people are always asking her, how can you foster all those kids? Don't you get exhausted? And she says, oh, Jesus because Jesus is the answer to that question for her. So it's still possible to live a surprising life if you want to. We had, we had a guy, we, we recently partnered at Habitat House. Some of you have done Habitat Houses. We had a guy in our church who, he, he, he works in, uh, in, in sales, and he works entirely on commission. And he started taking a bunch of days off to go work on this Habitat House. So that's his income, right? One of his coworkers said, what are you doing? He explained to him what he was doing. Why are you doing that? And I think he was too chill to say, I was hoping you'd ask. But, that was the, but he really was hoping they'd ask. And he said, oh, Jesus, that's why I'm doing that. I mean, I can give a better answer than that. But the answer is Jesus, right? Live such good lives among the pagans that they might see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Always be ready to give an answer. You can, it, only, it only makes a difference that you're ready to give an answer if someone ever asks Five habits this book suggests might help us be a little more surprising. Um, I think they're good habits. I'll mention them real quickly. If you're interested in thinking about them more, go read the book or do the ser sermon series at your church. He suggests that if we decided to get intentional about blessing people who don't expect us to bless them, that would surprise the world. Don't bless the people who expect you to bless them. They're not surprised. But bless the people who don't expect you to bless them. That might surprise the world. He suggests the habit of eating with people. Especially make sure at least some of your eating with people is with people that don't expect you to eat with them. 
that would surprise the world. They might ask why. Eat with people. He suggests one of my favorite chapters in the book is where he talks about learning to listen to the Holy Spirit. He suggests that the Holy Spirit is more surprising than we give the Holy Spirit credit. And you might just begin to ask the Holy Spirit to teach you how to be a little bit weird in a godly direction on a daily basis. And the Holy Spirit might guide you. It's a great chapter. One of the habits he suggests is that we learn more deeply from the person and character of Christ. Because if you have forgotten just how weird Jesus was, you have forgotten. This guy was surprising. Nobody knew what to do with Jesus. People asked him, what is up with you? And he would say, well, Jesus, which is a little awkward because he was Jesus, but that was the truth even then, right? Even him, well, I'm what's wrong with me. I, I'm kind of the thing here, you know. It won't be quite as weird when you say it. The last habit he talks about, I love this habit. He talks about the habit of remembering that you are sent, which is kind of where we started. None, none of us like to talk about evangelism. We have the unwritten code. Remember, I won't ask you when the last time you shared your faith is, and you won't ask me, so we can all go about our way and pretend like we're still following Jesus. He says the habit here is real simple. He says, just remember that you're sent, that there is no such thing as an unsent Christ follower. Everyone who is a follower of Christ has also been sent out by Christ. And the strategy Christ gives us is not that we all have to be Walter Scott or we all have to be the Apostle Paul. In fact, for the vast majority, the strategy the Bible teaches us is quite remarkably simple. It says just live a life that is weird enough in a godly direction that someone might notice and someone might ask. And when they ask, you could tell them about Jesus. Let me pray for you. Oh God, call us out. Call us out of our very normal lives. Call us into lives that are surprisingly loving surprisingly kind. Call us to be a people that are surprisingly generous and surprisingly patient, surprisingly forgiving and surprisingly welcoming and surprisingly brave and surprisingly quiet and surprisingly hopeful. Don't let us give in to guilt because we think we aren't the evangelists that Walter Scott or Paul was, or we aren't the evangelists we wish we were. Don't let us give up on being the reconciling work of Christ, all we who have been reconciled, but rather, God, let us live questionable lives. Dear God, I just ask that somebody here might have the great, wondrous moment, even this week, that's my prayer, God, that this week, somebody in this room would accidentally surprise the world. And somebody would ask, why did you do that? Why, why do you live that way? And they would get to say, well, I'm so glad you asked. I live this way because of Jesus. And that your wondrous gospel work would be alive in us. This is our prayer, God. Let us surprise the world. Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let the King of my heart be the mountain where I run. The fountain I drink from, oh, he is my song. Let the king of my heart be the shadow where I hide. The ransom for my life, oh, he is my song. You are good, good.
Thank you. Amen. Amen. Give him praise this evening. Pray with me. Jesus, we thank you for who you are and for all you've continued to do this evening. Um, thank you for the word from Ethan. We pray that the words that he spoke would uh, teach us something new and fresh about you. We pray that we take these words that we've heard, these, these things we've experienced, and they don't just stay here, but they go outside of these walls and go back to our communities and change the world for you so that we can show others just how loved they are. We love you. We praise you. It's all in your name we pray. Amen. One thing I was taught when I was a, a kid was to say thank you. And I also learned at a young age to give thanks in all circumstances. 1 Thessalonians 5, 18. For communion tonight, and as often we read Matthew 26, 26 and 27. It's a great, great passage. 
and of course, it is a very important part of our worship. But I want to suggest just for a moment that maybe sometimes we miss part of this verse, maybe an idea in this verse. I want you to notice in just a few moments as I read this, that before Jesus gave the bread and the cup to his disciples, Jesus gave thanks. Listen to what it says. While they were eating, Jesus took bread, took bread, gave thanks and broke it and gave it to his disciples saying, take and eat, this is my body. Then he took the cup, gave thanks and offered it to them saying, drink from it, all of you. I want you to think just for a minute how Jesus in all circumstances could give, give thanks at this time. Surely he knew that he was going to the cross, yet the agony that was there on that cross that he knew would be there, he gave thanks. Some might just think that this is just, just a matter of formality, maybe some type of custom or something along that line, but just nothing more. But may I suggest one thought that comes to my mind is the formality was following that of Passover. It took them back to the deliverance of Israel from Egypt. It also looked forward to the sacrifice of the cross. God provided the first use, looking back uh, with thanksgiving, with the second use in mind, looking forward to the cross of salvation. We sometimes forget that Jesus was completely human and yet completely God. It was there, excuse me, it was there for very appropriate for Jesus to show us that we need to give thanks at this time. I submit just a couple thoughts for you as we think of what Jesus did in giving thought, giving thanks. He said an excellent Excellent example, the Lord's Supper. He gave thanks in that his hour had finally come, sacrifice. And finally, he gave thanks on our behalf, people who need forgiveness. So with this re these reasons, I also give us some greater reasons that we need to give thanks and remembrance at this time, our salvation. With his sinless body, he was worthy to make us free. With his pure, clean blood, he was worthy to purchase us and make us clean before God. So surely tonight, as we remember what Jesus has done, in remembrance then is to give thanks. That's what we do in communion as a community. Let's pray. God, our Father, we come to you knowing that your plan has been there forever and even more. Father, we know that we couldn't be there to see Jesus die on the cross for my sins. But you've given us something to remember every week as often as we do it to partake of your body through the, uh, through the bread to have cleanliness because of your blood that we might have hope to live with you once again. So as we partake tonight, may we remember what you've done for us. And it's in Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. As one body, would we take the bread body of Christ together. As one, may we partake of the blood of Jesus together. Folks, we're going to take up an offering. You know why? Because that's what church does, doesn't it? You know, I was, I was thinking, 189 years, and I started thinking about the history 
uh, that our country's been through, and of course the Civil War was mentioned, <laughs> then I started thinking about World War I and, and started thinking about the Great Depression and World War II, and then all the things that have happened up to today. How in the world did they meet every year? Well, they loved Jesus, and they loved one another, and they thought it was important to get together. Now, to accomplish this, somebody has to give something. Well, a lot of people tonight for this service gave time, gave of their talent. Some of the churches here have provided certain things for us. Somebody had to fix all that communion we just participated in. And somebody had to provide the music that the choir sang. And so there's a lot of things that go into place. And usually the speaker gets paid, but I think tonight we're doing something different. <laughs> We're taking you to Starbucks so you can be weird. That's right. That's what we're doing. <laughs> so it's real simple, folks. It takes money uh, to pull everything together. Uh, and just like it is in your congregation, not much happens unless you have the funds to do it. And so we're not asking for a lot, but we are asking for you to help participate. This, this may continue. Uh, we're going to have another year coming up next year, 190. That's pretty cool, isn't it? But if we don't have the funds to do it, it'll make it more difficult. So let's pray together. And as they pass the plates, I would ask you to give as the Lord directs. Pray with me. Dear Father in heaven, you are a mighty God and you're awesome and you provide all things for us. And you have been faithful in so many ways. And Lord, tonight we gather here and we want to give you the honor and glory. And so Lord, we're going to take up an offering. And we want to take this up that it might be used to glorify you and further your kingdom. And so, Lord, we would ask you to bless this offering and bless those that give. And, Lord, we just thank you. We thank you for Jesus. We thank you for your Holy Spirit. We thank you for the church and that we get to rub shoulders on our journey back to you with other people that love you. Thank you, Lord, for all that you do. You are awesome. And we pray this in the name of your mighty Son. Amen.
Hey, I'd like to thank everybody for coming out tonight. We appreciate everybody. I'm Phil Troy, but I'm one of the pastors to serve on the staff of First Christian Johnson City, and I'm also on the planning committee to help plan this convention. And we appreciate each and, every one, each and every one of you coming out tonight. I'd like to thank David Clark and Boone Creek Church for hosting us again this year. We really appreciate what you all do for us. I also need to thank John and Sandy Conley and Cody Patterson for their work and assistance with the AV needs of the convention, helping us with sound and the graphics and stuff that we have. Also thank to Larry Green of Christian Financial Resources for providing our refreshments before the convention and they're hosting tomorrow morning the church staff breakfast at Milligan Annex in the uh, McCormick Dining Room at Milligan College. I also need to thank Ryan Hughes for the, the work that ministry at Crossroads and your praise band for helping us tonight. Thank you very much. <coughs> thank to Ethan for our message this evening on the fire of the world and how to be weird. <laughs> thank you. I also need to thank Tempa Bader and the choir. Special music, we appreciate it. Thank you, Tempa. Tempa has served this convention for several years. We're thankful and appreciate you for your commitment for all those years you've done. Appreciate you. Next year is the 190th annual meeting. It's going to be held at First Christian Church in Johnson City. We're hosting it. And the date will be October 28th. We'll have a special event celebrating that uh, year, 190th. <coughs> I hope that you will mark your calendars to be there. So let's pray now for our benefit. Father, we're thankful for this opportunity we've had to worship with you, to celebrate with you. We're thankful each one is here, for all the churches represented, for we know that we're all just a branch office of you. We're thankful for the gift of eternal life you've given us through your son Jesus. We're thankful for the hope that we have. And it's through Jesus that I pray. Amen. Go be weird. <laughs>